What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the podcast, America's favorite podcast in the whole world. I'm just kidding. I made that up. I, I, probably America's most unprepared pod, podcast. So, so we, could, we could probably fall in that category. What I do here is I answer your questions, which is why I'm not prepared, because I think it's better if I'm not. Because you ask me a question, anything, could be about any subject, and you email it, podcast at grangersmith.com. That's an email, podcast at grangersmith.com. And I will answer it as unpreparedly as I can, because that would mean, that would, that would make it more like you and I are sitting in the cab of a truck and you ask me a question, we're driving down a back road and, and you say, Hey man, could I, could I run something by you? Something that's been bothering me. And in that situation, I would not be prepared. I would say, shoot, tell me. And you would dump it on me and I would give you my best advice as a, as a friend, um, with a, with, with a biblical worldview, sitting firmly on a biblical worldview and, and try to come to continue to direct you back towards what I firmly believe is um, the right, the true worldview. That, that, that's the that's the introduction of of trying to explain um, why I like to keep this loose. Okay, let's go to the first question, and it comes from Katie. It says, "Hey Granger, this is Katie. I'm 38, married." For 16 years, got three kids. Uh, Both my husband and I grew up in church. My husband doesn't like most churches uh, we have attended as an adult. Either he thinks that they are slightly racist or too old school. It's interesting. He loves Jesus and prays at night like I do, although lately has been questioning the religion of Christianity. Says that Jesus was the king of the Jews and Christians in general have been evil in the past. My question is, should I follow my husband and understand his questioning or find a church myself and go alone? So Katie, right off the bat, I, I, you know, we're, we're riding in the truck, we're having this conversation, and I go, hey, let's, uh, let's clarify a couple things here. You say in your, your little second segment here, it says, he loves Jesus and prays at night like I do. Literally the next, the next sentence is, Although lately he's been questioning the religion of Christianity. It says Jesus was king of the Jews and Christians in general have been evil. So, so like, I don't know if you're trying, if he's, if you're trying to say that he is thinking he's putting a separation between Jesus and Christianity, the religion, um, which Christianity in itself means little Christ. It was that term, that phrase was originally used in a mocking way from from the scoffers looking at believers in Jesus going, oh, you little, you little Christ, which is you Christians. You just try to, you're trying to be like him. And to that, we as Christians, we say, amen. It's a great title. (laughs) You know, thanks. Thanks for calling us that. You know, that's the goal. We want to be more like him. So, and really, that's our calling, is to, to be through sanctification, which after conversion, we, we are s- slowly um, shedding our identity with this world and, and, and gaining our identity in Christ and becoming more and more like Him. And then, and then when we receive new bodies and we're redeemed from this world when we die, or if He returns, then we will be like Him in a glorified sense. That's getting, maybe that's getting too theological for this question. But, but here's the deal. And Katie, I don't think we over-spiritualize this. I don't think we overthink this. I don't think we have to call it what it's not. I don't think we have to say things like, but he loves Jesus and prays at night. He thinks churches are racist and old school, which is, I don't think we have to say any, any of that. I think we just call it what it is and say, you, you need to say, my husband's not a Christian. He's not. Which is why all these weird questions come up. Um, which is why he says that Christians have been evil in the past. I mean, let's let's think about that statement for a second and how strange that would be. If you know, I've defined Christian Christians as being little Christ. And the, them people, humans, 
faulty, imperfect humans trying to emulate another and in that messing up and and falling victim to their 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 worldly sinful fleshly passions like we all do and then then blaming the person that they're following for that it's it would be like i see a kid on the street with a basketball and he has deflated the basketball and he's using it like a paddle and walking around town slapping people with it you know and he's like the kid that gets in all the trouble because he's slapping everybody with a deflated basketball and i look at that and i say i never trust the, the nba can't stand the nba i mean look at that look at that and you go granger that is what that has nothing to do with the nba at all it's nothing at all to do with professional basketball. This is just, this is a kid who's using a basketball in the wrong way. And so that's, that's what I think every time someone says Christianity has been, or Christians have been evil in the past, I say, does that surprise you? That, that, that shouldn't be surprising to anyone. What should be surprising is that any Christians are actually good at all. If you see that, you should say, that's a miracle. Because I knew that person before he knew Jesus. I knew that person, and he was a wretch. And now look at him. He's actually kind of decent. That's a miracle. We don't say that as much. Usually we say the opposite. We say that person says they're a Christian, but look, they're actually a hypocrite. And to that I say, as a Christian myself, Christians are really and should only be the only people in the world who gather together and actually realize that they are hypocrites. The rest of the world's hypocrites too. They just don't admit it. Christians should readily admit, yes, we're hypocritical. Lord, Lord, help me. Lord, help me in my criticism, in my hypocriticism. Lord, help me be better. Like we, we should live in that world. We're just constantly digging and stirring and, and desiring more and shedding, shedding the flesh. Okay, so where does that leave you, Katie, you know, with what I've said? It leaves me with, to answer your question, should I follow my husband and understand his questioning or find a church myself and go alone? Well, you, you can't follow your husband because he's not going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. He's, he's dead in the water. He is spiritually dead, and he's... He's emotionally dead for you to follow. So um, he's like sitting, he's like in, in quicksand right now. So there's, you can't go in there with him um, unless, and this is another conversation we would have if I was in the truck with you, I'd say, tell me about you, you know? Let, me know? let me know more about what's going on with you. Because... How do we know that you're not in the same boat? I think that, I think we would, that, those are questions I would ask. These are things I would wonder. Um, and so the, the answer to should I follow my husband is that's a no. We, we could eliminate that. That's off the table. Um, and then the other thing is, let me, let me kind of circle back to the beginning of this question where you said, um, your husband hasn't liked, hasn't liked most churches you've attended um, he thinks they're this, or he thinks they're that, or they're just not quite as what he wants. Um, we know now that he's not a Christian, so we know that none of those reasons matter at all. Because a non-Christian has no business deciding which church they will go to, right? Th that's common sense, right? That, that doesn't, you don't have to be religious, you don't have to be a Christian at, at all to agree with me on that, right? We, we could say, that if, you, if you're not part of the religion, then you can't be part of the decision of which group of that religion to gather in, right? That, that's totally obvious. Um, and, and so, yes, to you can continue searching, and you might be able to go back to some of the churches where he said he, they were slightly racist, 
that's very strange. I would want to ask many more questions about what you mean, what you mean by that. Um, because if you, t if you take the Bible and you take it to its most logical conclusion, it could be the farthest, furthest thing from racism that you could possibly find. Um, all people are created equal in the eyes of God. That's clear. And then the old school thing, that's, that's an argument that, um, that's another interesting question I would want to ask more about because, because the Bible, the message in the Bible has not changed. And, and so the only thing that changes really is the culture by which we apply the truths of the Bible to. And so if a church is not keeping up with the ability to apply solid biblical unchanging truth to an ever-changing fleety culture if they've lost the ability to do that um, and that's what you mean by old school then i agree with you but if you mean by old school or if your husband means by old school they sing old songs i say well all songs are going to be old in 10 years these days uh, if you say old school, meaning that has old people in it, I say, that's great. I want old people in the church. Um, if you say old school in terms of they do old timey things like light candles and, and go through different kind of liturgy, then I say that's probably the, de the denomination you're looking at and not necessarily that particular style of church, right? I'm, I, ho I'm hope, I hope, sometimes I do this podcast and I don't, I don't know as a whole if I'm making sense, if you're tracking with me. I hope you're tracking with me. But here's my point. Your husband's not a Christian. You might not be either. You need to keep looking for a church. A Non-Christian shouldn't be the deciding factor on which church they like. Um, you have to pour yourself into a bunch of other believers. Let them bring you into the family. Join them. Of course, you're not going to follow your husband. You can't follow him because he's not going anywhere. Um you need to love him. You need to, you need to understand him and be there for him and serve him all these things. And you need to, you could still go to church and do still love and not judge and not be hypocritical and not push him out. You could still go to church and join a body of believers and sit under faithful teaching and have your own quiet devotional time with your own Bible and learn who God is, which we see as he's revealed himself through the Bible. We get to know who God is because he's told us about himself through the Bible. So as you start to read your Bible every morning and you learn more and more about who he is and you, you surround yourself with other believers and you still love and serve and respect with gentleness your husband, that's the best you could do. And you tell them the gospel. And then you, and you pray <laughs> unceasingly for his soul, for his salvation. And then one day he comes in and he says, you know, I, I got to tell you, Katie, I, I've watched you and the kids go to this church. And I've watched how they have loved you and wrap their arms around you and how you have loved them and you've served them. And I'm, I feel left out. And what I see out here in the world and everything else going on, I don't see, I don't see that w with where you are. I, I see something special there. And do you think I could go with you? I could join you. And you could say, yes, I've been waiting for you to say that. And I would say that would be a really really good scenario to happen through this. I hope, I hope that I'm clear on this. Let's, let's go to another question. Shelby. Hey, Granger. I don't know how to take care of this problem that I've been having. I have terrible nightmares that stem from being raped as a little kid. Then as I got older, I became addicted to pornography. I have been freed from pornography for about two and a half years now, but I continue to have frequent nightmares about 50% of the time. All of the nightmares that come, come from these two things are nearly unbearable and make it difficult for me to even try to sleep. Every time I close my eyes, these things play through my mind. I don't know what I need to do in order to make these dreams less frequent. Okay. Thanks, Shelby. So sorry for this horror uh, that sounds like you're in right now. Um, 
I have two things for you right off the bat. Number one, you, you have to understand that God is sovereign. God is all-purposing, all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign over everything, including evil, including salvation of souls. He's, he's, he's sovereign even over free will. He's sovereign over everything. That does not deny the, the, our human responsibility to respond to him, to respond to his word, to his sovereignty as his people. But we have failed to do that. We have failed to do that in every way. Knowing this, God sent forth his son, Jesus, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. And he did that by living a perfect life, going to the cross, dying on the cross. Three days later, he resurrected from the cross, proving that the, that, that sacrifice on the cross was accepted by God. What does that mean? It means that he took on the punishment that we deserved for rejecting, for not responding to him. He took on that punishment onto his own body. He became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, Peter writes, so that he could then reconcile us, or another word for that is he could bring us to God because we've, we've been separated from him through our sin and all our problems and all everything that we have done to separate ourselves from God. Jesus goes, I bring you back to him. I bring you back to him and I do that from the cross. So all who look to him, Jesus, repent, turn away from their sin and believe in him and turn to, turn to Jesus in, by faith, then we are redeemed which means we are justified, which is a, a, a great way of saying we're saved eternally. Our souls are safe. Through that, through that being safe, that being justified, what, what happens to us is we are adopted as sons and daughters of God, of the, the king of the universe. That's incredible. Co-heirs with Jesus, who he gets it by divine right as a son, and we get it as an adopted co-heir, which is crazy. Heirs to the kingdom, all of it, ours. And when that takes root in your heart, and you begin to ponder for a moment our total depravity, our, our desire to seek things like pornography, like you said, or anything else that separates us from God. And the fact that no matter how bad it, it gets for us, that, that Jesus comes in and goes, I die for that. I died for that. I died for that. Look to me and you're safe, justified, redeemed, restored, forgiven, adopted, co-heirs. You're mine. Okay? So then we look to him, and, and when that takes root in your heart, these things just start to break their hold in us. These ideas that we are, that we're addicted to something, and we're 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 having nightmares about something, and then it, it, everything is temporal. It's all temporary, and and these temporary things they start to lose their hold. They start to just slowly break apart, like old paint on a fence. It just starts to flake away. The stuff that once was just so polished and had us held and glued starts to break away and just fall off. That's what happens when the gospel takes root in your heart. And that's why I say it to you, and that's why I repeat it to myself, and that's why I say it every time I'm on this podcast, because Paul says the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It, that hearing it, hearing it, is, is a mechanism that starts to break apart that paint, that temporal paint in your body that just goes, I, I am not of this world, and I hear that now. That's number one. Number two, this is getting into the realm of, I would encourage professional help with this. Because when it starts to become outside, the, 
when it starts to become um, in in the in the world of ruining your your ruining your life because there is a there is something that is stuck in your mind that needs to be unlodged and it's it's a it's it's at a neural level that's in your sleep then i say there may may i'm not advocating any of this but i'm saying there may be a doctor that needs to see you i would say that would that would be an, an encouraging thing for me to tell you after you've heard the gospel and you let that take root in your soul i say it would it would not it is secondary, yes, to the gospel, but, but I would say it would not be a bad thing to then see a doctor with these things. If you want to get a hold of me, go to cameo.com slash Granger Smith, and I can send you a video message made right here on my phone, whatever you want me to say. Happy birthday, happy anniversary. It's a great way for you and I to stay in contact and to get someone a gift that might seem to have everything. Hey, get them a gift at cameo.com slash Granger Smith. So your next question comes from Anonymous here. It says, hey, Granger, I love your music and your podcast. I've been going through a tough time lately. My mom and dad got divorced when my sister and I were two. My dad has not supported me my whole life and always puts me um, underneath his own needs before anything else, including his own kids. To keep this short, I have not been to the house, I'm, I'm assuming his house, for two years because of many situations that have happened. His parents have not been doing well lately, and um, I went up last year by myself to see them, and then I got yelled at by them for about two hours for not showing up for my dad and that I have not been to his house. I am torn whether to go back or not. I know I will regret one day if and when they pass and I did not see them. The rest of my family supports me, some more than others, but I would love to have some of your input from the outside looking in. Thanks for your time. Okay, Anonymous, appreciate you. Let me dive into this with the information that I know. Um, your dad is, th this is a story we see, a typical, typical story, uh, a dad not in your life. I wish I knew. I wish I knew if you were male or female. I don't know. Um, and he, he's a narcissist, sounds like, and, uh, you know, your typical narcissistic dad. Um, and then like a typical narcissistic dad, as he gets older, um, he starts blaming you that you don't come to his house when most of his life he has kept you out, kept you at bay and underneath his own needs. It's always interesting, but it usually happens that way, right? Uh, he's going to blame you for abandoning him after he was never part of your life. So you go back and you visit your grandparents, right? It's interesting that you said his parents and you didn't say my grandparents, which I don't think there's another way to look at it besides they are your grandparents, but you, sh you haven't said it that way. You didn't say that. You never said it that way. Okay. <laughs> so you said his parents have not been doing very well lately. And I went up there last year by myself and got yelled at by them for two hours for not showing up for my dad. So they don't even support you. There are probably things anonymous that I don't know about you. And so I don't want to assume that you're perfect here. In fact, I know I don't. I know that you're not. And that's okay. Um, and that I don't need that information but, but I will say there, there might be some big things that I don't know that you have done in the past and kind of riled people up. And that's why um, half the family is mad at you and the other half supports you. So I don't want to get too deep in this conversation without knowing you at all, without having, you know, all these secondary questions I have answered. Um, but we could, we could look at this at face value. You got yelled at them for two hours for not showing up. I'm not concerned about that. I wouldn't be concerned if you and I were talking in a truck about that because you can't control it. You can't, even if you've done stuff in the past, you can't control if they yell at you. 
But what you can do is control how you respond to them. It's the only thing you have control over, really, in these kind of situations is how you respond to them. Are you loving? Are you kind? Are you respectful? Are you gentle? Are you non-aggressive? Or are you someone that wants to argue about every point? Are you someone that stands with no humility? In, in fact, you stand with some kind of fierce pride against everything that they're, they're trying to make an accusation against you with. That doesn't get you anywhere. It, it, it doesn't prove a point for you to be the better person in this situation by standing proud and, sta- and standing firm in your, your resolution, you know. Especially when it comes to family, that just doesn't get you anywhere. Instead, you come in with humility and you say, Grandma, Grandpa, I believe you're right. I, I have not been there for Dad. And in your mind, you're thinking, but because Dad's a narcissist, that's why I haven't been there for him. And if he only was better to me growing up and he wasn't and he, he was oppressive to me, and that's why I avoid him. That's what you want to say. Just don't say it because, it because ultimately they know this. So it doesn't need to be repeated. Instead, you say, you know, you're right. I haven't been there for him. And that's not a lie. They are right. You haven't been there for him. So you're just repeating the truth. You're right. I haven't been there for him. And a son assuming your son, a son should be there for their dad. I want to get better at this. Can you help me get better at this? Can you imagine if you actually said it that way, in that tone, if you said that, they they wouldn't be yelling at you for two hours like you said here. That would have ended in 10 seconds and they would have been like, oh, well, yeah, let's talk. You see how quickly it gets diffused, but it takes, it takes a measure of humility to get there because the, even me, as I say that, if I'm in your situation, I have to fight this sudden urge, this pride that wells up that goes, I want to fight you. You're yelling at me, so I want to yell back to prove my worth. And you ask me, look, in the very last sentence you said, I want to know your input from the outside looking in. And that's a a great way to look at it because from the outside looking in, I don't have any pride in this. I don't have any reason for you to win an argument or for you to look good or to be be held up in in a nice light that is irrelevant to me. Instead, I just, I want you to have peace. I want the situation diffused. I want you to get to a place where you could to begin reconciliation with your family and to, to even get there to the position of where reconciliation can begin. Somebody has to put down the pride. And like we said before, since you can't control them, it only has to be you. You're the only one that has control over your own pride. Now, of course, we hope and we pray that they come to the same kind of conclusion and they start welling up with their own humility and putting down their pride, humbling themselves, but that you can't control that. And odds are they probably won't. So let's go to the next part of your question. You say, I'm torn whether to go back or not. I know I will regret one day if they pass and I do not see them. Then that's on you. Because I believe you're right. I believe you've said it, you've typed it, you sent the email. I believe that you are you're, you will self fulfill your own self prophecy. That if they do pass, you will have a level. Maybe it won't be crippling, but you will have a level of regret for not going to see them. And so, how do you stop that? You go and see them. You say, Granger, they might yell at me for two hours. I think we kind of went down that road. I think we figured out how to defuse that. Humble yourselves.
And as far as your dad, it's the same thing. And we deal with this almost every single podcast. I, I will say something along the lines of to forgive someone is not the same thing as trusting someone. It's not the same thing as seeing them in a different way than you ever saw them before. That's not what forgiveness means. Forgiveness doesn't mean, Dad, I forgive you and thereby see you as a different person than I used to see you as. I, you used to be narcissist, and now you're not anymore. That's part of this forgiveness is not true. You know that. Everyone knows that. So forgiving your heart position is, is part of this humility. It's part of, part of humbling yourself, saying, Dad, Dad, I forgive you. And I want to be here. And, he, and, and you're thinking in your mind, but you've never been here for me, Dad. And, and you know that, that this forgiving doesn't change that. But it sure will give you peace. And it sure will prevent you from having that regret of not being there whenever, whenever your grandparents pass. So you go back into the fire. You humble yourself. You listen more than you talk. You fight the urge to well up in pride and, and lash back when they lash at you. And I think you'll walk away feeling a lot better. Next, next question. We have time for some more. Let's do this. Next question says, hello, Granger. I'm currently 20. This is from Brandon, by the way. Uh, 20 years old from Missouri, who is studying cybersecurity as well as at, at a well-known university. My father has a 1979 Chevy Camaro Z28 in the garage on Jack's. It is his first ever car that he bought when he was 17, and he told me a lot about it. Right before I was born, he stripped the Camaro to nearly the frame and sold it all with the intention of being it being a father-son project car during my teenage years. Well, a divorce happened, and that never happened. Earlier, he told me that he's considering selling it to a scrapyard next year to free up space since he's never been able to have the money to restore it. Since I was 16, I, I have dreamt of surprising him with the money to restore it um, or using it for using some sort of life insurance policy uh, money to restore the Camaro. Um, and I've, I've even planned on putting $300 a month into savings for the next 20 years to afford uh, a professionally built uh, Rister mod, which is around a hundred thousand dollars. He says, I would like to talk to him about it this fall. And while we're out fishing, I don't really know how to convince him to keep the Camaro. He needs the space in the garage and needs every bit of the money, but I know he's emotionally attached to the car. I don't have any place to store the car now. And to, uh, to counter any question about finances from you on or my father, I know that I will be well off with money given my career path and my salary potential, um, conservative spending, my parents' life insurance. So money will not be an issue. Any advice on this approach would be awesome. Thank you, Brandon. All right, l let me try to follow what's going on here with you, Brandon. You, you think it'd be cool to restore this car. Your dad is going to give it away because he needs the money. Um, but you don't have the money right now. But you're saying, but I will because I've got, I'm, in, I'm in a good career path. And so money's not going to be an issue. I'm kind of shocked at this hundred thousand dollar thing. Is that right? Is that is that what a 1979 Camaro fully restored cost is a hundred thousand dollars? That is insanity. Is there a, is there a more affordable way to bond with your dad? <laughs> that's okay. That's that's the first question I have. Look, man, I I, I, see, I get it. It's um, it's an heirloom. It's a it's a piece of your dad that that you remember. I can't help but but wonder though if if it's if it's more of a a challenge for you and less of a bonding thing. Like maybe you just really want an awesome car. Maybe that's part of it. You, you're like maybe part of you goes It'd be awesome to have a fully restored 79 Camaro. 
especially it's 20 years old. I mean, I, that's, that's a pretty average common 20 year old dream to have an awesome restored car. Um, and I get it. I, you know, for me, similar situation with my dad restoring the 74 GMC pickup, except for full value of mine restored is maybe, maybe 15,000 bucks. So we're, we're not talking the same game here. You know, we're talking, <laughs> it's not the same. Um, and, and mine also was a, a COVID project. Uh, and I had Butch and Bull, my two buddies helping me restore that. And it was just in mom's barn. And, and we did it for a YouTube project. Really, that, that's kind of why it's different. I don't know if I would have done it in any other circumstance. And so in that way, I do relate. And in that same way, I, I can't relate, especially to the $100,000 thing. If you don't have the money right now, then I wouldn't rely on that money coming in one day that could, because that could be a major problem. If you're thinking, I will have the money, I know I'll have the money. And then if it doesn't come, then you're in trouble with the Camaro. So my suggestion really is simple. The most logical conclusion to this is you just meet with your dad and you tell him this while you're fishing. You say, dad, because maybe he doesn't know this about you. Maybe he just thought no one cares. This Camaro thing was my idea. Brandon just went along with it because he's Brandon. He's my son and he loves me. But this thing is, this was always my deal. And so I got to get rid of it. I need the money. But maybe if you came to him and said, dad, I want to let you know that Camaro thing is not just your deal. I think it's a big deal to me too. And I would love the chance to be with you and restore it. By the way, I'm throwing out the idea of the professionally built remod, Ristamod, 100,000, throw that out. This is about you and your dad bonding through this together. Tell him this. Tell him, dad, I've been thinking about putting away 300 bucks a month. I, I could pay that to you if you just keep it in your garage. Let's do this, Dad. I want you to know I would love to do this. And then if he says, I just, I can't do it, son. I, I need to get rid of it. Then you got to let it go. I think you got to let it go. This is a different story right now if you have the money. Brandon, if you have the job already, uh, then it's a different story. So maybe you just say, okay, Dad, can you make me a deal? How about this, Dad? Give me five years. Give me five years. It gives you a good chance then, Brandon, to save the 300 a month, to secure the job in, in the career that you want. And dad just stores it for five years. If you don't make it by then, dad gets to sell it. If you do make it by then, you buy it from him and you guys help restore it together. I think that's a good compromise. If your dad says no to the five years, then that means he really needs the money and you got to let this thing go. Let's go to another question. Once again, if you have a question podcast at grangersmith.com. One more. Next one comes from Anonymous. It says, hey, Granger, uh, I want to remain anonymous. I never loved to, to read growing up, but over the past few years, I've, I've grown up uh, with a passion for reading. I homeschool my kids. My husband and I lost uh, a child in 2015. Um, she lived for 16 and a half hours and then passed away into my arms. I'm writing because I would love a list of books that you recommend uh, that they could be grief journey books. They could be biblical growth books. I do prefer real life growth type books. I would also love recommendations for books that I could read to my children. I recently in the past two years started back at church after stepping away from it in 2015. We are a reformed Baptist denomination. If that matters, I look up to you and Amber and, and how you have both let God's light shine through you. Thanks in advance for your help. Yeah, anonymous. Like you didn't have to be anonymous for that kind of question. Um, this is probably a a format with, that wouldn't be helpful for me to go down a list. First of all, I don't have notes in front of me. It would just be off the top of my head, and and I would say for for biblical growth, um, in in this situation, I would go to the Nine Marks collection, number nine, M A R K S. There's a bunch. If you go to Amazon right now and just type in nine marks, there's a bunch of very short, easy to read, very practical, super down to earth, just 
points in one direction type books. And they all are very short, talking 100 to 120 pages type short. Um, super easy to read and 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 uh, multi topics. So you could look at one on on um, what is a healthy church, you could look at one on conversion, which we talked about a little bit earlier in the podcast, you could look at one on baptism or discipling or elders. Um, there's there's a the pretty decent list of different topics in biblical growth, like you're talking about, that I think could be really helpful for you. And so I don't necessarily have a list of grief journey books. I'm besides, I guess, besides like a river, I don't, I don't run to those type of books, except for some of the older classics, like um, C.S. Lewis, I, anything by C.S. Lewis, he has a way of poetically and practically wrapping himself around a topic that needs to be understood. He did that in his children's books, and so we can go there too. And that could be the, the second part of your question. I think I would, if you're recommending books for your children, I would love to see them go to classic books like Chronicles of Narnia. Um, I have Lincoln right now reading The Hardy Boys from the 1920s, really, is when those books first started coming out. And, and then they were made popular in the 50s, and I read them as a kid, and, and I think every boy should go through the Hardy Books, Hardy Boys books collection. So um, London right now is reading Alice in Wonderland. So there, I would stick with classics. It's, and, and they might resist at first, but it's so important to have them grounded in, the, in those classic books. Um, what am I missing here? Um, uh, the C.S. Lewis I would go first is A Grief Observed. That is his grief book as he was reflecting on the loss of his wife. A Grief Observed. Um, another great one by C.S. Lewis is Surprised by Joy. Man, an, just a great way. A, um, Mere Christianity, another famous one, was a book by him as he was... It's a great apologetic book, meaning it's a great book explaining what is Christianity? Who is God? Where does all this come from? What does any of this mean? And, and what, what does that mean for me? He wrote it in light of World War II, and it was actually first a radio program. And it's, so it's going to start off without even mentioning Christianity. It's just starting with the natural law and how we get there from that. Um, and so I would, I think that's, that's the list I would start at without knowing you, without knowing anything more about you. I think it would stick there. I love, my, personally, I love history. I love biographies. And that, that would probably just bog down a list of boring things for you. Um, but, but I think it's a good question and probably better answered in a different type format like um, social media where I could actually write some stuff out for you. So if you guys have an email or a question for me, email podcast at grangersmith.com and I'll see y'all next Monday. Yee. Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel, hit that little like button and notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. Yee.